Uh, for those who have just joined us, good evening. Um, we're just waiting for a few more people to make their way through into the seminar. I guess it's sort of the digital, digital equivalent of people slowly shuffling into the room. So we'll let them digitally shuffle in a little bit more and we'll start in maybe three or four minutes. Okay, then I think we'll make a start. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the final CIPL evening seminar for this term. For those who don't know, CIPL stands for the Center of Intellectual Property and Information Law. I'm John Liddicote. I'm a senior research associate in the law faculty and a member of CIPL. I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Danusha Mendes from Bournemouth University. I won't read out uh, Professor Mendez's biography, that's available online, but I'll provide a little pricey. Professor Mendes is a global leader in intellectual property law and is the co-director of the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence for European Intellectual Property and Information Rights. She has a world-class profile, particularly in the area of digital technologies and copyright. Danusha has been called to the bar and is a member of Middle Temple Inn. Now, typically a CIPL seminar or CIPL seminar speakers focus on usually one intellectual property regime or in some cases, only one or two decisions. Tonight, however, is, a, is an exception to that rule. Professor Mendes led a multi-year EU commission project titled the Intellectual Property Implications of the Development of Industrial 3D Printing. And this included the analysis of patent law, copyright law, design law, trade secrets law, and trademark law. This project followed on the back of multiple articles and an UK IPO commission project on the same topic. Now, clearly, we don't have time to hear all the details of this uh, commission project tonight. That the whole report is available online, and I thoroughly recommend that people read the whole thing. Well, perhaps not the whole thing. But we do have time for the highlights tonight, and I think we're in for a real treat. Just before I hand the floor over to Professor Mendes, I should also mention that if you have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A box on Zoom there, or chat to me directly. I'll run through all the questions at the end, and if there's too many, I'll try and group them together and make some sense of it. But the floor is yours. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for a very kind introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here, really happy to be uh, uh, one of the speakers at this series, and um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I was mentioning earlier that I have a bit of an unstable internet connection, but I think I'm going to brave it and keep my um, video on. However, if, for example, the reception gets bad, then if maybe John, you can let me know, then I will switch off my camera um, as we go along. Um, so moving on to the talk, as John mentioned, um, 
I'm going to be speaking today about a project I did for the European Commission. And what I want to do in the next uh, few minutes is, first of all, um, to give a, uh, some context and also overview of the project. So talk about a little bit about, you know, how this project came about, and then also talk about the objectives of this project and the team and the methods that we use. For the majority of the talk, I will be focusing on the, the, the study and I will look at some of the selected legal issues, um, industry opinions, and then our findings, conclusions, and recommendations. Um, finally, I just want to say a few words about the work that's been done by the European Commission since uh, the project's been uh, published or the, um, since the report has been published. And there was a report that came out on the 6th of November. So I just want to touch base on that um, in conclusion. So a little bit of context uh, to this project. Um, back in 2017, uh, the European Commission uh, produced this report and it was called the Balanced Intellectual Property Enforcement System. And it looked at various different aspects of IP. And uh, in that report, there was also mention of 3D printing. But a little bit after that, um, the following year in June, 2018, there was a report by the Committee on Legal Affairs and that report really focused on 3D printing and what it means for IP and what it also means for civil liability. And in this context, um, the European Commission was kind of so had started the work and was very interested to understand whether anything should be done in this field. And um, in July 2018, this report was adopted by the European Parliament. So this is a little bit of background um, in the context of this particular project. But it's worth mentioning, as John also mentioned, that in the context of uh, the UK, there has been a number of funded projects in, on 3D printing um, and its implications for intellectual property. And um, for example, there was the, actually the UK was one of the first um, countries or one of the first UK IPOs to have commissioned a project in this area. And that was back in 2013 and was a project which I led for two years and completed in 2015. There was another project which was really focusing on IP, which was funded by the HRC, and that was between 2015 and 17. And then the UK IPO once again, taking forward the, recommend uh, the recommendations of the project that we did, um, commissioned a second project on 3D printing, and that was carried out by Dr. Angela Daly, and that was completed last year. So there has been quite a bit of work in this area. And of course, since I remember the first article I wrote back in like 2012, um, I remember at that time, there was really nothing on it, but in the last eight years, there's been an abundance of literature in this area. But of course, time and time again, we have come back to this issue of, you know, what are the challenges and what, you know, whether we need to clarify the IP framework um, in the context of 3D printing. So this project is at the back, as I said, of the, um, the reports of the commission. And this project started um, in 2018. So now like two years and a, and a bit. Um, there was an expert roundtable in November 2018 where having done uh, or having set out the structure of our report and our project, we then invited um, industry experts as well as legal experts. And we put our thoughts to them and, and then received feedback. Um, we had a final workshop in October 2019, and then we ended the project and published the report this year in April 2020. So what was the brief of this project? Um, it was really to, like, as the title goes, to explore these intellectual property implications related to the development of industrial 3D printing. And of course, 3D printing has been in the news a lot, and there has been much focus on consumer 3D printing, but this project was really focusing on industrial 3D printing. Um, and as I mentioned before, it was all about trying to understand the gaps and clarify the IP framework, looking at opportunities, but also challenges and any obstacles. And what was really um, important in this project was to do so from the perspective of seven selected sectors. And the commission was very keen for us to look at the aerospace, automotive, health, consumer goods, construction, energy, and industrial and tooling um, sectors. So th this project really focused on those. And when we looked, when we spoke with industry stakeholders, they were from these sectors. The reason why I have put some of them in bold is maybe just to highlight to you as well that 
um, sectors like aerospace and automotive, they were one of the first sectors, and especially aerospace, to have been involved in the uptake and adoption of 3D printing all those years ago. Um, so first was aerospace, then it was automotive. In the recent past, and even in the recent years, and even in the past years as well, and so in this order, health has also been one of those areas where 3D printing has been used quite a lot, whether it be in implants, whether it be in the dentistry or organ and tissue structures as well. So for example, earlier this year, we were looking at more from the perspective of bioprinting. And we wrote this article with Professor Anas uh, Santosh uh, uh, Rushman from St. Louis University in USA. And it was all about looking at the health sector. And in more recent times, of course, there has been this focus on consumer goods, construction, energy, and industrial and tooling. So I just want to say a few words also about the team that took part in this project. There's a quite a few of us, as you can see from this slide, um, Bournemouth University SIPM, we led this project and I led the project, but along with me, there were a, a team of legal experts, the IP team. Then there was a team of industry um, and they came from Nottingham and also from a company called Added Scientific which is very focused on 3D printing. And then we had a team that was focused on the empirical side and on the policy side that really focused on um, looking like with the interviews and all that we had to do in that context. So there was a, quite a few of us in this uh, team, as you can see from the slide. And as in terms of the, uh, the work packages, that's kind of how we went about it. So we start with the lit review then we went on to mapping the value chain of all the sectors. Then we synthesized that to come up with some um, kind of basis for going to speak with the industries. And there we um, spoke with uh, various industries, which I'll highlight in a minute, and uh, also explored. Um, we had some case studies which we were exploring, so went with that. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we had the expert meeting, the final workshop, and then finally um, our report. Um, so here's the report, that's a, just a screenshot of the report. I have put um, in my slide how many um, pages it, it is, and the only reason why I say that is because it is a large report, but it's got a nice executive summary, if you would like to um, go and look at it as well. Um, but also to say that whilst I'm presenting, as I mentioned, it is a large team and we also also you know, we had very um, specific roles. So today I am going to give an overview of this project. And if I do talk about the law, I might speak probably more closely from copyright law, but of course the report covers all aspects of IP and goes beyond that to also contracts and also um, like trade secrets, etc. So the legal study, as I just mentioned, the four main IP rights, including database rights, trade secrets, contracts, uh, that's the areas we looked at. We looked at, for example, the challenges, whether the law was fit for purpose or not. And then um, we explore these issues from the perspective of protection, exceptions, infringement, and licensing. However, it was really important as well to make sure that when we are doing this, that we approach it. Of course, it's a, it's a legal report, but really keeping our focus on 3D printing. So, as a result, what we did was that we had this model, which we used in every single aspect. So whether we were looking at protection, whether we looked at infringement, whichever area we looked at, we came at it from the perspective of 3D printing. So in this model, what you see is the entire process from starting to design a CAD file to what you do with that. I mean, you might just use it um, or you might share it. You might send it off to a bureau service, which is sort of like, the photocopy, shop, uh, the photocopy shops of the past, like we have um, that, that we had. Um, and then, you know, the actual printing for which you need materials, you need the hardware, um, something called STL file, which I'll also explain, and then you will distribute it and then you might license it. So that's kind of the process and that's how we approach uh, this particular um, study. So for the empirical study, um, we had we interviewed 41 um, key um, stakeholders, so 41 different industry stakeholders. Um, they came from those seven sectors that I mentioned, and they came from different parts of the value chain. So what I mean by this is that, you know, we spoke to um, industry stakeholders from 
those who are designing files to those who are preparing, the, those who are creating material, processing, post-processing, the product, all of that. So we try to capture the entire uh, part of the value chain in our interviews. Um, we interviewed very large 3D printing companies, but we also interviewed SMEs as well. And we did this from the perspective of 14 um, EU countries, um, and we focused on Western EU, but also um, on some other parts of the EU as well. So we tried to kind of cover uh, a wide possible uh, breadth as possible. So that's just a very quick overview of the project and the team uh, and what we were aiming to do. So for the next part of this talk, I want to focus on some of the legal issues, the industry opinions, and our findings, conclusions, and recommendations. So um, I'm going to start with the first one, which is about designing a CAD file. And I should say, I'm going to spend a little, uh, just a bit of time on this part because it was the area that generated the most amount of, uh, I would say, discussion and also the most amount of questions from industry. So, and it has been, I mean, when, even when I was doing the UK IPO project or the HRC project, this is an area that came up with questions time and time again. So I will spend a little bit of time and then move on to the rest as well. If you've been to any of my talks previously, you may have seen this um, slide. I use this quite a lot. Um, it is from 2013 and it's, you probably can guess it is from 2013 because it talks about an iPod, I'm not sure that, we use iPods as much anymore, but the code is all about that. A 3D printer without an attached computer and a good design file is as useless as an iPod without music. So in other words, it is um, the hardware is important, but the software is equally or more important. And I've underlined the words good design file, and that's what I want to start with. So you may have all seen CAD files, but if you haven't, then that's kind of like what it looks like, a CAD file. Um, and that's just a very simple example of it. And on the right-hand side of my screen, you will see that um, uh, like kind of a construction graph. So that's the written iteration of the 3D model. And then here you see the actual um, 3D model. So I put the written iteration in a red square because that's quite important. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so I, may, I kind of mentioned the European Commission's uh, report that they did, the Committee of Legal Affairs, back in uh, 2018. And they made some uh, very specific, or they identified specific issues, and of course one of them was about the CAD file. Basically say that, you know, because it can be distributed electronically, as we have seen with other forms of um, IP protected works like music or films, and so too with 3D printing too. And it's just like a new type of, I don't particularly like the word, I guess, file sharing, but it is a new type of way of sharing those files. Um, and we have kind of online platforms that are just dedicated uh, to 3D printing uh, files. So, um, and that's what the commission was highlighting there, that care should be taken in this area and also because of the fact that it's easier to copy because it exists uh, electronically before it takes physical form. And also that maybe a distinction should be made between uh, private use and printing for commercial use. And two more kind of points they made, which I thought was, it was interesting. So one is that legal ex experts are of the view that 3D printing has not really fundamentally altered IP rights, but the thing is that it has raised various questions um, as to whether such a work, whether, it's in, like, uh, whether those files are actually a work and whether they should be protected as such. And also um, this kind of a new era of DIY or make it yourself where um, only that you might get the software for download and the specifications for printing the product. And in that kind of situations, you know, what are the implications? So we put these questions to our industry stakeholders, the 41 industry stakeholders that we interviewed, and we asked them in their opinion and in their experience um, in industry, whether they think there's a lack of clarity in the law regarding the protection of computer-aided design files. And as you can see from the slide, uh, there's a, it's answered very strongly in the affirmative that they feel that there is a lack of clarity, which of course we knew from our previous, um, you know, like the kind of the literature that has been already uh, written on this topic. But 
what we were really interested to understand is from an industrial perspective, why do they think uh, there's a lack of clarity? So here are some of their views. One is that they really um, had lots of questions about the difference between the legal uh, and the difference from a legal perspective the, between a CAD file and a 3D model, whether they should be uh, protected separately. Um, and also whether the information that is stored and the geometry of the object, you know, is that just a mathematical expression or is it software code? Because ac according to which either there is IP or there's no IP. And they had that question for us. And of course, there's the, a uh, lot of the time, the this discussion came up about CAD files and STF files. So CAD file is the industry standard and it is the kind of the um, standard that's used by most designers around the world. And it is the, the standard, it's, it's used to kind of design like what I showed you earlier. But when you're ready to print it, you have to turn it to some like a different file format. And what that is known as is the STL and it still is a very popular file format uh, to turn that into. And I'll, and I'll show you an illustration of that. But one point to note here is that a designer's IP is normally found in a CAD file, that's where the source code lies, prior to it being transferred into an STL format. So let me just tell you what I mean by this. So um, on this slide here, what you see is the two separate or the two different types of files. On the left, you see the SDL file, and um, it's kind of like an interface as well. What you see is like what a cons uh, customer might see. It's a pendant, but you can also change the color of the pendant or the, uh, the, like the design. So there's um, scope for customization here, which is um, almost going one step further than just printing it. And then what you see on the right-hand side and what I put in a red box there is the CAD file. And that on the, or what you can see there is the written iteration. And that's where the IP actually lies. And that the design. More and obvious separate um, diagrams or like two separate products. But if I have for confidential reasons, uh, iteration of the polar pendant, but just to maybe just give a rough idea. Um, that's kind of like the very first part of the, uh, the construction graph, as I call it. And um, if I was to kind of put that into our kind of, you know, the academics, I would say that's probably like the, the first page of a book. I mean, this construction graph is so long because of the fact that this designer is not only designing the polar pendant, but is also designing in a way that it gives customers the opportunity to mass customize it. So this is almost like a mini program within the larger program, which is you know, quite interesting. Uh, and all of that is captured in the CAD file before it is transferred into the STL format. So these are areas where they had various questions for us and said, that's not, these are the areas where it's, there's no lack or there is a lack of clarity. Perspective very quickly to have a look. So we are looking here at the legal status of the CAD file versus the 3D model. The 3D model, of course, from a, let's say from a copyright perspective, it can be an artistic work. Um, the CAD file, I find it really interesting. And, you know, I've thought many, I've spent many days and weeks and months probably you know, and years <laughs> thinking about this and um, the CAD file to me is almost like I see it as like the like Microsoft Word or like pages or PowerPoint or Keynote um, it is like the basis for us to create something the the actual model for me is what we write it's like our journal article what we type into Word what we type into the PowerPoint so in a way that's, I feel like I can see that there is a distinction. Um, and also it is important to point out that the 3D model cannot actually exist without the CAD file, they are interlinked, but yet at the same time, a 3D electronic or like an e-model can be realized as a physical product and can exist independently of a CAD file. So that is quite interesting. And once, and once it is printed out, then it's, 
like a separate product in itself. And there are plenty of cases that looks at, you know, similar uh, like scenarios in the case of like loom instructions and fabrics or in the case of knitting instructions and garments. And in a more recent um, CJEU case of Cofemel, uh, which was about um, artworks. So, but in, in some it's pointing towards protection and in others it's saying there's no protection. So also from a jurisprudential point of view as well, there is that kind of question mark still hanging over it. Like what is the legal status of this and whether, you know, it can be, um, whether both can be created or, or sorry, whether both can be protected uh, or not. So our conclusions based on the findings that we um, did the findings of the empirical research and also that of our legal. Um, and as I said, like in the report, you have an entire section where all of the IP rights are considered in this context. So I have just, you know, just given a very brief overview. Um, we concluded, especially from the perspective of um, patents, copyright and design laws, that there is a lack of clarity when it comes to CAD files, not so much from trademarks, but from patents, copyright and design. Um, and of course, we found this lack of clarity coming out in the industry stakeholders as well. So what did we recommend to the uh, commission? We uh, recommended that they should clarify the elements, what elements of a CAD file can constitute subject matter or protection and for which IPRs. Um, also that a separate assessment, a legal assessment should be carried out um, of the CAD file and the 3D model. It en encompasses to understand this like this dichotomy I just uh, spoke about. And then I've just given some aspects, as I said, from copyright, which, um, which I will touch on from time to, and, uh, from time, to time. And um, under copyright law, whether uh, to recommend clarifying that software embedded in the CAD file can be considered a computer program in accordance with the EU copyright law. I just want to clarify that. This is the part where I was talking about where you have the basis, so you have the source code in the actual program that's being created for designers to use and to create 3D models. But where a programmer or where a designer is creating, let's say the polar pendant with options for, um, like say for example, mass customization. And I showed you that uh, slide where it said you know, let's say author's uh, personal touch, their intellectual creation. Um, and at the moment, like there's this question mark, but is it not just instructions? Is it not just mathematical uh, equations? So there, you know, with that kind of, um, I guess, lack of clarity, so hence the reason we made this uh, recommendation. And also whether we also recommended that to consider whether the 3D model should be seen Therefore, it's a distinct work separate from the resulting uh, physical product. And we feel that the law. Okay, so just a few words also about scanning, just going on from the CAD files. And um, again, I'm coming back to that document from the commission back in 2018, where they again identified the impact of scanning on various different laws. And first of all, actually, they mentioned privacy and image rights. But as we go on, there is this um, recognition from an IP perspective that not, of course, all 3D objects are automatically assumed to be Ill uh, illegal. However, counterfeit items can be produced easily if, of course, scanning is available, um, you know, quite widely. Um, so here's an example. Actually, this is not from the commission, but I just want to use this project to highlight something when it comes to scanning. Um, and we, even in this project, we did look at jewelry as well. So jewelry was one of the aspects from the perspective of consumer goods that we looked at. And here you can see a um, piece of jewelry and what you see like sort of like an iron is in fact a scanner. And, you know, and then you see a different piece of jewelry on the second picture, but we were going to scan the first item. And when we scanned it, it looked like that, like a black blob. And when I say we, it wasn't me as such, but there was a, um, colleague was very experienced in scanning. But after he spent a lot of time scanning, he realized that actually there was a moving part in that particular piece of jewelry. And therefore they had to place a little blue piece of 
felt underneath and start the process all over again. And this took a huge amount of time. And, you know, again, if I was to come at it from, you know, think of it from a legal perspective, like the anger, the, the lighting, you know, all of that had to be uh, considered and some uh, choices had to be made. So if you are, for example, you know, if you think of it from a, like from a copyright perspective, you are making some creative choices in this context. Um, and then ultimately cleaned and what, you know, many hours later uh, and a day later, that was the ultimate product. So, um, and I've just got this very um, short kind of, uh, well, it's, it's not a video, but just to show that, you know, this was like the, what he was doing um, for the whole, whole day. Um, and then obviously I had to go back and start again um, to get the product, um, you know, scanned um, effectively. Oh, I just thought I'll put that. It's not really relevant to the project, but I just thought, um, you know, I was scanned and 3D printed. And so, you know, apart from what I'm talking about as well, obviously, and that's of course not in relation to myself, but when we talk of image rights, all of that, that does um, come into play. So when we think of scanning, um, one thing we did find out was that 3D scanning has an impact on almost all industries, um, whether it's in um, aerospace, automotive, consumer, health, all of that. Um, of course, what we did also find was that in the health sector, it is used really a lot. And the, in the recent past, this has grown significantly. Um, and this was very interesting for us to see. And when we were looking um, also at consumer, we also noticed that um, it is also used by museums a lot for preservation and also uh, for the reproduction of their collections for exhibitions. So this again uh, was a very um, interesting finding for us. So again, we go back to our, our interview, our interviewees and we ask them about what they think about this area and from their own experience. So, you know, from the various sectors, uh, particularly, and there's a, like clearly the health sector was an important one, but again, consumer goods as well as of course, I mean, the others too, aerospace, as I said, they all were involved in this area a lot. And what you see again is a very strong affirmative that there is a lack of clarity relating to the ownership of what we call the scanned design data. So we call it design data, uh, but that is the, um, the, from the scanning process, like the resulting uh, design data from the scanning process. Um, so here are a couple of quotes as well from the industry reviews, basically pointing to the fact that scanning does uh, present completely different set of challenges. And therefore, if the law should apply, then it should be fashioned in such a way that it can accommodate uh, the peculiarity of design data. Um, pointing out the fact that scanning is not straightforward, as I already hopefully illustrated, it's not immediate, it needs sophisticated equipment, and also it needs some form of know-how as well. Um, but there were some doubts that were raised as well, as you saw in the answer. I mean, most people agree, there were a few who did not. And those who did not question whether scanning will be mass used to fabricate copies of objects, uh, or maybe this is just not, you know, maybe it's not worthwhile. But of course, we had to take the obvious, the majority was very much um, of the opposite view. And some, like a few people talked about maybe it's the enforcement that was uh, an issue as opposed to a need for a law change. So from a legal perspective, you know, this one was quite interesting to us in some ways that there was such confusion amongst our industry stakeholders, because when we look at it from a legal perspective, especially when it comes to data and from an IP perspective, um, you know, it is a very clear, um, it's 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 uh, it's very clear, but um, I mean there are two points here I want to raise. One is that a CAD file, which is created through scanning a physical product, so you know it could be new work, it could be a derivative work, but of course if it is, for example, representing uh, the author's um, personality, their expression, their free and creative choices that I spoke about, and also very much um, you know we were very struck as well at the time with. The copyright directive, of course, um, came into force, Article 14, which talks very much about out of copyright works, again, kind of saying that, you know, if it's out of term, then obviously there's no copyright clearly, um, or there's no IP rights, but um, thereafter, I mean, 
but unless the material resulting from that act of reproduction is original in the sense that it is the author's own intellectual uh, creation. Um, but in terms of our conclusions, um, like I said, the law is clear in this area, even though there's confusion amongst the industry stakeholders, um, because um, you know the law, IP law does not protect um, data per se. Uh, but of course, the, it is important to distinguish between the 3D model and the and the CAD file, which could potentially be considered a computer program. And so, in this in this context of the design data, we do not recommend changing the law because. Uh, there's no practicality to that. I mean, there's no practical need to do so at the moment. And of course, there are other areas of law, such as trade secrets and contracts, which are, of course, better equipped to provide adequate protection. So I think um, even though there was a confusion from a legal perspective, we felt that it was very clear what the law, um, you know, that the, 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 I mean, there's no confusion from a legal uh, perspective. So few words about printing. I um, don't want to go into too much in relation with that because this is something that's been developed over a number of years and it's probably the most, uh, the area that has the most clarity. Um, and here, when we asked our industry um, stakeholders uh, about the hardware in the uh, 3D printing industry, um, the protection of hardware, again, they had a very um, strong um, opinion on the affirmative uh, where they felt that the law was clear in this area. So I won't say anything more about that because it's something that already from a, I think a hardware perspective, a lot of work has already gone into this. So it was more the software side of things where a lot of um, issues I would say uh, came up. And then just to say a few words about the last bit of the uh, 3D printing process. I'm just checking whether I'm on time, hopefully, so okay. Um, so distribution of the printed good and the licensing of it. Um, so going back again to start with to the what the issues that were raised by the commission before the we went on with this project, they really focused on uh, traceability of the design files once something's been uh, produced and um, and on this slide what you see is like I guess different. Um, types or like different scenarios where traceability could be very useful. It might be in the first scenario where um, there's been a damage cause as a result of, a, of uh, from a 3D printed um, object. And then, you know, where, for example, I mean, that's more product liability issue. It's not really uh, you know, kind of, I guess, uh, relevant to us today. Um, then there's the issue of like um, encryption and the protection of files to prevent those files uh, from being reproduced. And then there's also a security issue as well. And in the past, you remember that some years ago, there was all these things about 3D printed weapons. And, you know, it was at that time as well that this uh, report came out. So um, when it comes to licensing and traceability, um, what we found out was that licensing from others was not really a common strategy amongst small companies although um, few of the interviews were open with this idea of getting license to reinforce their, um, their, kind of their, their core technology. But we did also see that cross licensing um, did emerge and that was something we saw that some other larger companies were more involved in. Um, mainly in this case, actually set the uh, patent infringement uh, lawsuits. That was quite interesting. Um, and as part of like traceability licensing, you know, once the, once something has been um, 3D printed, um, we kind of asked ourselves as well whether blockchain could be, whether it could act as a part solution. And, um, you know, blockchain could be an effective solution for the traceability of files. And already there's uh, various um, efforts with the employing of watermarks. And uh, again, so in that sense, you know, blockchain could be like the next step. Um, but of course, you know, blockchain in itself, I mean, of course, encryption is another uh, matter and maybe, uh, you know, in encryption can be used for the controlling uh, printable objects, but blockchain itself cannot control the type of uh, printable uh, objects. 
And these are the recommendations which were made by the European Parliament in June 2018. So before we started, um, some of their recommendations revolved around a, glo a global database of printable objects. Um, I, I, I mean, I guess, you know, we did consider this, but for us, and I'll talk a little bit about our project and how we kind of approached it, but this is almost, we felt like along the lines of maybe like an iTunes kind of uh, system, but um, you know, who monitors that, who decides what goes into the database. Um, so there are various questions there. Um, another one was introducing a legal limit on the number of private copies. And again, you know, who kind of monitors that, who sets the limit. Um, I think there are various questions there. But the third one is about imposing a tax on 3D printing to compensate IPR um, holders. And of course that we do see already when it comes to other forms of media. So that's clearly a possibility. Um, but again, we when so in our project, that's we put this question again to our industry stakeholders asking whether it is important, uh, whether traceability is important from both an IP and we also put in product liability as well. Um, and you can see um, at the top of the slide, they talk about traceability uh, becoming uh, really important and then uh, saying that you know, it is something that um, I don't expect you to read the whole thing on this uh, slide here, but maybe what you can also see is that there's a strong uh, take up of, or like a strong consideration of from the industries that traceability is very, very important. And I would say of all the questions, and I mean, there are some questions I couldn't put on, put in this uh, presentation of, of all the questions we asked our interviewees, but I would say of all of them, I would say this one, I think has the greatest number of uh, agreement, whether they strongly agree or agree, uh, they all felt that this was definitely the way forward. But of course, they had some other points as well, apart from agreeing. Um, so one was that they did point to the fact that there are some CAD file formats where it is not possible uh, to place a watermark um, or even um, or to make any changes because uh, the source code is encrypted, so that was like an issue. But um, majority, and like you saw that, like over 30 of them, 34, believe that what is required is a clear and also inexpensive uh, kind of system that works in practice. And these, they felt that is something that will become relevant and will become more uh, and will be adopted in time to come. Um, and it will be used more and more, and it'll be used more and more in the coming years. But they also pointed out to the fact that, um, you know, it is something that um, whilst they are looking forward to something like blockchain maybe acting as a part solution, that it is important for industry to address some of the um, issues in relation to quality management, assurance, simplicity, reliability of production, or material uh, reliability. And so those are areas where they felt that, you know, more work needed to be done. So it just cannot be like this one technological solution and that's it. Um, and finally, just to um, kind of bring my presentation to an, uh, or the last question that we put to, the last question I'm sharing with you today, um, with the new business models in the 3D, in the 3D printing sector kind of um, breaks the barriers for startups and SMEs. And again, we here have a very strong agreement from our 41 industry stakeholders um, answering that in the affirmative. And they identified uh, three areas where this could really is happening uh, at the moment. So one is of course, uh, commercialization of CAD files through intermediaries. Uh, then we have the democratization of access to design and manufacture and also innovation by experimenting with current technology. Um, but there was a few, like just a, a few of them that gave the opposing view that feel, they felt that commercializing via, uh, like, uh, sorry, commercializing via uh, intermediaries are usually not sufficiently protected by current IP laws and therefore they felt that it could lead to a higher risk of infringement. So, um, but generally um, the, for example, the industry stakeholders we spoke to really felt that, you know, that was definitely, it really does break down the barriers for them. And, uh, and you know, it, it is an area. And also, you know, when we think of intermediaries, I guess 
our mind might go to like the consumer again, but actually quite often, like even companies that were in the consumer market are now almost suppliers uh, for designers uh, and these are for professionals uh, in this way. So they really were very much in favor of this. Um, so yeah, so our, our final conclusion and recommendations here was that, um, you know, licensing for CAD files definitely has the potential to create new business models and to reduce the barriers to entry for startups and SMEs. Um, traceability, we, rec we recognize that it's still underdeveloped in the AIM field, but we felt, but we recommend that um, technological solutions such as blockchain be explored and be considered for the traceability of this file so that, you know, it can, it can provide better uh, protection um, in a different, in a kind of symbiotic way, along with the IP framework. Um, and this is, if you look at the report, you can have a quick snapshot view of these are our final conclusions. Um, and as I started the presentation, we did come at it from, uh, or, you know, the report is obviously looking at, you know, going through the different aspects of IP from protection, infringement exceptions and licensing, but the whole way through, we used our 3D printing process model. So as we, uh, and we came from that perspective and I've shared with you some of those um, findings and conclusions. And these are the our final recommendations to the commission um, from CAD files to design data, materials and hardware uh, from exceptions on the context of infringement and also licensing um, and traceability. The last slide before I end is um, what I mentioned also at the beginning that on the 6th of November, there was a commission staff working document, evaluation document that was published. And this is very much on the design protection. But in this document is again, another long document. Um, I think it's about 181 pages, something like that. Um, there's a, there is a lot of reference to the 3D printing report that we uh, completed in, April 2020, and there's a lot of discussion about their next steps. Um, and basically, there's an event in two weeks' time where this is going to be taken forward. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm speaking that as well. And uh, so that's kind of the next step to what the commission is going to be doing and what the parliament is going to be doing uh, to taking the work that was done and completing April uh, forward. So that's a very quick tour of this project and a very quick overview. Um, I'll sh stop sharing my slides and I'm very happy um, to take questions. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Tanisha. That was a wonderful talk. I think one of the problems we have in this new digital world, just putting 3D printing to the side for the moment, is, um, as I'm sure most of us know, there's a lack of applause and there's a lack of change of feeling in the room when a speaker finishes a talk, especially after speaking for so long. You're wondering um, what's going on. So let me just say that was wonderful. And it's it must be so challenging to summarize a complex project and a complex topic like you've done. So thank you very much. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of all the attendees. Um, so while we wait for some people to uh, type their questions into the Q&A, I guess I might take the, uh, the chair's prerogative and ask a question myself. One of the things you recommended earlier on in your talk was the idea of offering clarity on protection of CAD files. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about this. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those areas where, you know, it's been debated a lot in the literature. And I remember even way back in 2012, when I started first writing about it, one of the questions I had was in relation to the CAD file. And in some ways you might say that, you know, but isn't this already, I mean, why is it an issue? Because, you know, the software, we have this, um, you know, the software directive, everything is very obvious and, um, so why is it such an issue in the 3D printing context? But I think that the issue is that on the one hand, you have, you have the file, like I was explaining, like the file and then that's the basis. Um, and it's kind of like when we, like even with music, when you remix, 
mm -hmm. you have just a piece of music, then that's fine. You start sampling and remixing, but suddenly there are new IP issues that are thrown up. But it's only after it's only at the time of someone started remixing and sampling that those issues came up, not when music was just there. I mean, that's one thing. And of course, the other thing is that when it comes to um, CAD files, so like one aspect is that what I showed about the polar pendant, which is if, for example, a designer is not just creating something, but is giving a consumer options for changing it, then, and they are creating almost a mini computer program. Like I mentioned, I said that it's like the first page of a book. And I look at the CAD file, like the, the base is almost like Microsoft Word or like PowerPoint. And I then look at like, but no one's gonna write my article. I mean, okay, that's the whole thing about AI, but I'm not going to go into that just now. Mm -hmm. But if you take AI out of the equation for a moment, I still have to write my book, I still have to write my article, I still have to put together my PowerPoint slides. So this is kind of the similar thing where for a designer who's giving all those options and who's giving mass customization options, is it, for example, a mini computer program within a larger one? You know, that's one question. And the second one is like an MP3 file. You have the music, it's embedded, it's all good. Um, and of course, but it's all like, you know, you will listen to that. And, and then if you were to go and perform at a concert, you have different rights too, right? Mm. Uh, you have performers rights in the music world. So like, if you think of the CAD file, you have the digital model. And then once it's printed and it is a standalone product, then it's got all the other patterns and the trademarks and all that as well. So actually, whether it should be a distinct work, whether the model and the file, whether, you know, and I think this is something that the industry stakeholders have the same question as well, because quite often their customers come to them and they will have like, um, you know, or like, for example, I was mentioning that the STL file and the CAD file, where, you know, all the IP is in that CAD file and they don't want to let go of it. Uh, but, you know, how, how do they kind of protect that? Yeah, right. That's and, and Sorry, keep going. I was going to very quickly end by saying that, you know, when, for example, quite often um, the question is, but isn't it a mathematical formula hmm. or isn't it just like instructions or isn't it just data? Um, so why should there be in protection? But then if someone is writing like an entire book and doing all that, then shouldn't they have some, and it's they're making creative choices and it's their you know, intellectual input, et cetera, then should there not be some form of protection? Mm. Mm. And also for the claims in patterns as well. Sorry, I'll stop now. Yeah. Do, do you think we'll get clarity on this point without a decision or, or do we need to wait for a decision from leading courts in Europe or perhaps the CGAU, depending on the regime? Yeah, I mean, this is where, um, this question was even asked, like I remember at the IPO time as well, whether we should wait for a decision. I mean, that is of course one way, but then also one of the recommendations we did make was, you know, there is what we need. I think what we need is maybe a little bit more clarity from that perspective as well. Um, but I think I'll be afraid to come. It might be that we might have to wait for a CJ because we haven't actually had um, such a decision so far. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've had uh, one question come through from uh, Kathy Liddell. Um, it's a question about, actually we've had two questions come through, um, but I'll, I'll deal with the first one first. The methodology that you used for the industry survey, um, how did you choose the firms and get their involvement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, I mean, uh, for us, it was very important for us to, um, the, at least for us, but also for the commission to ensure that we get like a very good cross section from the EU and also focus on SMEs as well as large companies so that we get as wide a perspective as possible. Um, and of course, as part of the project team, we had Dr. Professor Phil Dickens, who is one of the directors of Added Scientific. That's um, one of the first 3D printing companies that, you know, like uh, Nottingham is a very big, 3D printing hub. Um, so uh, in terms of, so I'm gonna give the non-legal answer or the non-methodological answer first, which is that he has a great set of contacts. So that was very good for us. But um, apart from, 
so uh, that was that was helpful but the methodological answer is that um when we're, when we're justifying like the companies that we go for we had to of course um you know when we're drawing that up and of course everything had to be passed by the commission so it was really a focus on um the kind of the cross-section of jurisdictions are we cover are we covering enough across western eastern you know when we think of the eu i mean we're not going to do all 28 but even if we did half of that you know are we getting a good section there and then obviously the large ones as well as the smaller ones um and then also the value chain as well so um that's where i mentioned you know like it's really important for us to understand speak to people who are involved in all parts of the value chain and not just focus only on those people who are designing a file only on those people who are like involved in the material side of things but really try and speak to that that wide variety so that's how we kind of came up with our list of um, stakeholders and passed by the commission and then they gave us the green light and then we started interviewing but it did take the reason why it went on for a bit longer is because the interviews of course took longer yeah i i engaged with similar issues before um one of the I suppose one of the hiccups that I know I've had previously with interviews is it, it's it's wonderful to sort of get the the value chain as you described it and the breadth of countries across the EU that you that you got. But one of the I suppose disadvantages with that approach is that as you spread out, it actually means that sometimes you might be getting a min minority view because you only got a small sample of say um, mass producers in. Uh, uh, France or, or Liechtenstein or something, you're only getting one view there um, when others might have other views. Yeah, I mean that, yes, and we do uh, highlight that. So in our report in the appendix, we have identified some, you know, like some of the limitations in our methodology. And uh, one is that, um, that we might, you know, get that like as, as, as you're saying. But again, this is where we felt to mitigate that. Um, even if it is like, if you go by country, then what you're saying is correct. But then if we go by, like we talk to larger, and again, even if it's in a different country, we're still speaking to like that same value chain, per, like a, another person, but in a different country, then hopefully we are, we are, like, we are mitigating that. And we are trying to get a more broader view from those different types of companies, the larger ones and the smaller ones. Mm. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, I suppose that, yeah, it's always a bit of a, um, you have to weigh up because you can't, one of the problems with doing interviews is that they take so long. And so you can't interview hundreds of people. It's just not really feasible for a project. Yeah, I mean, we had like, a, so the, the kind of the limit that we had was like, um, from the IR commission was up to 50. I mean, it was it was still, um, so 45, in 40 and still. So it's all uh, also on like, like, you know, as you know, the interviews, like sometimes it's availability and the time and all those kind of things that kind of come, like come into play, so. Um, but they were happy, so we were happy. Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, there's another question from um, um, Kathy came in, if we can return to a, a topic that we were just discussing before, and it was the idea of uh, clarity on protection, and I, I suppose um, enforcement as well, is that sometimes clarity can be optimised through a, a judicial decision. But in other times, um, we might see um, certainty in an industry just arise because of practice. Um, would you prefer to see a, a clarity arise in the 3D printing industry because of, I suppose, industry practice? Or do you think we should push for a legal decision here and, and perhaps even have a, a test case in some jurisdictions taken? Yeah, um, well, you know, I mean, I I, I'm also a big proponent of like, you know, sometimes you can have a good symbiotic and I mentioned that in my talk as well. Like, you mm. know, sometimes we see, um, I mean, IP is needed, but um, so for example, material is a good example of that, where that's why I didn't spend so much time on materials. 
where it actually through practice and through, of course, the law as well, but, you know, over years and years and years, that has been resolved and the clarity has come about as a result of the kind of practices that you're mentioning that's mm -hmm. coming out of the industry. So, um, and another one could be, potentially could be like blockchain. I mean, when you also look at, I also think of larger companies that we have now, like not 3D printing. You know, sometimes the enforcement has come because of company, those large multinational company practices yeah. and the way they, you know, if I think of like from the music world, like if you think of Spotify or Netflix and, you know, at some point we were almost like pirating and doing all this kind of stuff. And, and then this kind of new business models came in and somehow it's industry practices and, you know, it kind of stayed, you know, went hand in hand with the IP framework and we found a good solution. So I think that even with 3D printing, you know, there is a space for that. I think, you know, you can have good industry practices coupled with IP, the IP framework, and um, and then accordingly, hopefully you can get like a good results. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Actually, the, the blockchain idea that you were mentioning, um, I, I must admit, I've, I've researched a little bit of blockchain, but I'm not, I'm sure I'm not up to date, like some of the people uh, listening to us today. But one of the things that jumped out at me when we were talking about blockchain and traceability was a, a type of DRM, a digital rights management. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was wondering, you know, is, is that a, a new type of that? Um, and might we have to see some sort of support for blockchain in, in 3D printing or will blockchain by itself, the current technology be enough? Yeah, really interesting question and something that we also ask as well in the in the I know at least one person in the audience I can see is a is hot on DRM. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I you know blockchain on its own that's why I call it a part solution. I, I don't know that blockchain on its own can save the world, um, or to, you know in this context. But I think it's one of those things again that I think. Um, um, you know, could probably go hand, uh, hand in hand uh, with some support though. I mean, I, I, because I mean, I've also looked at blockchain, not from 3D, but printing, but just generally from a, from a copyright perspective. Um, and, you know, there are various um, like claims that, you know, it can take away the middleman or, you know, it is the ultimate solution for enforcement. But every time you do explore and investigate that, you always come up against, it can go so far. Yeah. But it just needs that bit, you know, I don't think it's on its own, it can resolve all the uh, intellectual property issues we have today. But yeah. it is definitely a part solution, I feel. Okay. Oh, we just had another question come in, and perhaps we'll make this the last one for tonight. I'm sure people have um, food to eat and, and family to go and see. Um, uh, from Alex here in the law faculty. Um, do you think different considerations would apply to 3D printing um, for artistic versus industrial pro purposes? Sorry, sorry what was the, I, can, I can look at the Q&A. Um, do you think there'd be different intellectual property considerations um, for 3D printing if we were to consider artistic purposes compared to industrial purposes? Yeah, that's a great question again. And, you know, that's kind of the, I guess, the question that was raised in the case, the CJEU case of Kofama, uh, which was very much about the artistic and the industrial. And this is where, again, I think I know in one of my slides, I was showing that when I talked about going back to the whole issue again of CAD file, you know, you know, is, is this a model that is the artistic or is it like, you know, is it industrial? Is it again? So we go back to that same uh, question again. And this is why in, in that context, um, and, I, and I think at the moment, the issue is that we have different opinions on that. And I'm not just talking of the literature, like the academic literature or the uh, literature we have, but also from the decisions we have. Yeah. And, you know, so I think that's, that is definitely um, one of the reasons. And I think call for mail is exactly that question. Um, the CJ you asked and, and said, no, I mean, you know, it is, if you, if, for example, for there to be uh, protection, it has to, it has to be original and it's got to have that um, intellectual creation and it cannot be the industrial aspect of it, you know, it cannot come into play. Yeah. 
yeah yeah i think that, but that's yeah, where we need the clarification that's i feel right. that's right that makes a lot of sense i mean it's in reality it's one of those um classic intellectual property type issues um and some jurisdictions even take different positions on it um especially sort of designs copyright overlap and things yeah, like that absolutely. maybe there's areas to be learned from there but I think that's probably enough. Um, thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, it's been a fascinating talk. Um, and I, to be frank, I, I'm glad that you brought me up to speed in some of the some of the latest thinking and some of the research in this area. It's something I've been interested in for a long time, and I'm sure all of our attendees have been interested in it for some time too. Um, and I'm sure we'll keep track of everything in the future. Thank you, John. Thanks again to everyone as well for attending and thank you again for inviting me. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Cheers.